This is Penelope Fulgrain. Now this is an 80 proof bulbin made from a blend of three different bulbin mash bills, leading to an ultimate mash bill of 75% corn, 15% wheat, 7% rye, and 3% malted barley. It's aged for a minimum of 46 months in new American oak barrels. Let's have some. It smells good. Kind of light around the nose. You definitely smell a little bit of that corn, but for me, more of what comes through is a vanilla. There's a slight peppery note, almost a little tabasco -y. That makes kind of this kind of light, kind of spicy nose. You know, you can really kind of tell that there's some wind in this because it leads to kind of this soft and mellow kind of mouthfeel. A little creaminess, but definitely on the thinner side. But yeah, just like on that nose, that vanilla comes nice and through. Along with little hints of, for me, I really taste um, like hints of orange, um, although you kind of do have to hunt for these a little bit longer because this is more of a light whiskey. And you get kind of that peppery Tabasco notes right at the end, um, but then that vanilla I think comes through more than anything. Like a lot of new world bourbon brands, they actually don't make their own. They blend it and they bottle it, but they don't distill it. Now this company doesn't have a rich history like you'll find with a lot of the other mainstays in the market. And the Bulbin just says news the guys who started with the company. Michael Paldini and Danny Plyce grew up as childhood best friends and next door neighbors in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey, in the suburbs of the New York metropolitan area. They stayed friends as they grew up, but ultimately went different directions. Mike went to walk all over the country, doing everything from mailroom walk at the Whitley Morse Talent Agency to working in Silicon Valley tech world at Salesforce. And he sold his own company with his brother selling direct to consumer mattresses called Bear. Danny, meanwhile, worked as a ball tender and bar owner during and after college before getting into the world of mechanical engineering in the HVAC world. Throughout their adult life, they were all very casual drinkers. They originally preferred scotch, but enjoyed the bulb when they tried, mainly Buffalo Trace, Eagle Rare. But Mike's entrepreneurial spirit was eating away at him, and he was ready to try something new and he wanted to do it to celebrate the child he and his wife Carrie were expecting. After reading an article about the largest distillery you never hold of, Mike knew that he could grow a brand with different marketing strategies that was not seen in the Bulbin world. He decided to name it Penelope after his unborn daughter. He reached out to his friends to see if anyone wanted to fly out with him to Indiana to select some Bulbin, and Danny answered the call. Once they boarded the flight from Newark, they were headed to Lawrenceburg, Indiana, while 200 Orioles in 1803 Another set of friends, Isaac Dunn and Steve Aletho, sold a small distillery. Now this distillery was incredibly small, with a single horse powering the grist mill, only allowing them to create two barrels a week. The focus wasn't on corn whiskey, like what this guy is, and what Kentucky was already known for, but instead rye. Nearly four years later, a man by the name of George Ross came to Lawrenceburg and saw the success Dunn and Ludlow were having with rye whiskey and opened up a larger distillery that used more modern techniques and equipment. He named it the Rossville Distillery. The distillery was built on an aquifer and used limestone waddle, the same that you'd find in Kentucky, to craft his rye whiskey, which helped him get a reputation for high quality. Ross wasn't going to be the only person to copy Dunn and Ludlow, but he's William Squibb, a native Indiana man from the nearby town of Aurora, decided to open his own and bought the Dunn and Ludlow's Old Distillery in 1846. He renamed the distillery WB Squibb Company, and then after modernizing that distillery, it was clear that they needed to expand. Squibb entered the market at the perfect time with a post-Civil War boom to the consumption of whiskey, which allowed him to grow the space as railroads came to Lonsburg, adding on product space and lots of warehouses, including government-run bonded warehouses. Despite being Nables, both distilleries were going strong and creating well-known products, at least until Prohibition hit in 1920. Both distilleries shut down, unsure if they'd be able to weather the storm. Now across the pond in Germany, George Remus was born in 1876. As a thoughtful, his family moved to Chicago, and he entered schooling shortly after. His schooling was disrupted at age 14 when his father became incapacitated, and he had to become the breadwinner for the family. He left school and started working for his uncle's drugstore. After a few years, he bounced that job, plus attending pharmacy school, and got his pharmacist license at age 19. But that didn't stop him. He then received an optometrist license shortly after, and soon started studying law. He completed a three-year law program in 18 months and passed the Illinois Bar exam at age 24. 
His practice of law relied on his medical background, and he pioneered the defense of guilt by reason of temporary insanity. This helped him win his oval and keep his clients out of prison, entering them into a mental asylum for a few months before being released back into the world. His usual clients were bootleggers during Prohibition, and he saw his background in the law and pharmaceuticals as a great way to make a ton of money. The only alcohol that could be sold during this time, after all, was for medicinal reasons. But alcohol got constantly stolen during Prohibition, and he thought if he could control the whole chain, cha-ching. He couldn't break into the business in Chicago, since organized crime was well-established, but he saw a better opportunity for him to start from scratch, Cincinnati, which happens to be about 25 miles from Lawrenceburg. He began to buy drug companies and use the connections he had within the federal government to get the permits to purchase and withdraw whiskey from federally bonded warehouses. During this time, he also bought a farm that would be nicknamed Death Valley. He bought a few distilleries, including W.B. Squibb and Company. What he then ended up doing was creating a monopoly of medicinal alcohol production in the Ohio area. He would produce his alcohol, and then he'd pay his employees to steal it and move it to the Death Valley farm, where it would be stalled and sold off to go all across the country. George's lavish way of life with his wealth is the perfect example of the Roaring Twenties, and he is in fact one of the inspirations for The Great Gatsby. He was known for lavish parties, and on several occasions would gift his polygoals incredibly valuable gifts, such as diamond tie pins for the gentlemen and new calls for the wives. His lavish lifestyle and reign on bootlegging only lasted a few years. By 1925, he controlled the alcohol distribution in nine states and had over 3,000 employees. He was then indicted on 3,000 counts of violations of the Volstead Act, causing him to spend only two years in prison. During prison, he befriended another inmate who turned out to be an undercover prohibition agent, Franklin Dodge. In the process, Dodge found out that George's wife, Augusta, in Mojean Brown Holmes, had power of attorney and was in control of all of his money. Dodge, instead of reporting this information, chose to resign and start an affair with Holmes. They liquidated and hid as much of George's money as possible. When George got out, he only got $100 of the millions he had when he entered. Holmes and Dodge attempt to get rid of Ramus by deporting him and hiring a hitman to assassinate him, both which failed. The hitman, for fear of double-crossing, decided to tell Ramus instead. Holmes filed for divorce in late 1927. Out of pure rage and anger, Ramus had his driver chase the cab that carried Holmes and Lodado as they both went to the colt. His driver forced their car off the road while Ramus then jumped out and shot home in front of horrified onlookers. He was prosecuted for this instance and decided to defend himself. The trial was highly reported as Ramus was seen as having a political future. He used his famous defense of temper and sandy, and the jury only took 19 minutes to acquit him. The state of Ohio committed him to an insane asylum where he stayed for only seven months. But it was too late to rescue his life. His money was gone, his empire was gone, and impossible to get it back. He tootled other loyals for six years before he moved to live a moss life in Covington, Kentucky, where he ran a small contracting firm. He had a stroke in August 1960, where he then lived in a boarding house under the care of a nurse, before finally dying at the age of 73 on January 20th, 1952. Now, once Prohibition ended, both WB Squid Company and Rossville Distilleries were bought by different companies. Rossville was purchased by Serums, a Canadian liquor company that had incredible success during Prohibition in Canada, and was ready to expand the conglomerate into the U.S. now that it was legal. WB Squid Company was bought by Shenley Industries, a new liquor company that started during Prohibition to produce medicinal whiskey in Pennsylvania. They used this plant to make the old Quakel Company line of whiskey. Shenley Industries was then purchased by Meshlam Rickless in 1968 and then sold to United Stillers in 1987, who then decided to close it. United Stillers went on to merge with Grand Metropolitan to create Diageo. Meanwhile, Seagram's kept the plant operating. They renamed it the Seagram's Distillery, in 1972, Larry Eppelsold began working at the distillery and became the master of the still. In this time, he created a new whiskey mash bill of 95% rye and 5% malted barley. And that is still popular today. It's used in several whiskeys today, in fact, including Whistlepig, Willet, Sagamole, George Dickel, and Templeton Rye. The Seagram's Beverage Division was sold in the 2000 to Pernod Recalled and Diageo, putting the Seagram distillery into the hands of Pernod Recalled. It was renamed Lawrenceburg Distillers, Indiana. Pinal recalled continuing to operate the plant, but mainly for contract distilling. Diageo, however, owned the Seagram brands 
but continued to contract Ponovacol to use its celery to make the juice for this brand. Ponovacol eventually created the Templeton Rye label in 2006 at this plant. They realized that they were running out of warehouse space, and instead of investing into the plant, they decided to just close it. However, in 2007, instead of closing it, it was bought by CL Financial. Now, CL Financial is this weird company that I can't find too much information about, except for that it's operated in Trinidad and Tobago, and owns so many different things from banks to real estate to energy to beverage companies. I do want to note something, I'm editing this right now, and what I will say about CL Financial is they'll bankrupt. Basically, around the housing crisis, 2007, 2008, 2009 time, they had to be bailed out. They will an insurance company that also owns stakes and other things, such as Angostura. In fact, they even owned Angostura at one point. Now that company collapsed, and the plant was then sold to Midwest Grain Products, MGP, in 2011. Meanwhile, some formal executives from United Distillers decided to purchase the formal Squip Distillery and tried to open up a contract distilling company, but decided to sell it to MGP, who now still use it for warehouses and bottling lines. This wasn't MGP's full stab at distilling. In fact, the company had been distilling alcohol since the end of Prohibition. Cloud L. Cray Senior created the company to supply alcohol for World War II. They focused on vodka and gin, as those were the cheap and popular spirits of the time. This portraits of the Seagram distillery acted as the first walking relationship with whiskey, while well, they began to specialize in contract distilling. In fact, they make spirits for different brands, is kind of an open secret in the liquor industry. They produce the spirits that are used, blended, finished, and then bottled for so many brands, including Angel's Envy, Bullet, Smooth Emblem, Templeton, and so many more. Let me grab all of the ones I have. So the ones I have here is they make some of what goes into High West Camp File, from what I understand. Um, they make some of what's in the Double Bale for Hamilton Rye. They supposedly make it for Redwood Empire. Nulu um, acknowledges it. Another one of my favorites, Freeland Spirits, it says Indiana. So that means it's probably MGP. So yeah, if you see Distilled in Indiana or Lonsburg, it's probably MGP. In 2021, MGP bought Luxco and started selling their own brands, including Ezra Books, Rebel Yell, Blood Oath, and Yellowstone Bombin. In 2022, they renamed the distillery from just MGP to the Ross and Squip Distillery, and all in all of the two men who revolutionized the rye whiskey market in Indiana and sold their dis distilleries. MGP's focus is now on whiskey as they announced the closure of their plant in Kansas, which was the original home base. And while the plant they use to make neutral grain spirits, such as vodka and gin, whiskey seems to be a much more lucrative market for them. And that lucrative market was one that both Mike and Danny were entering in 2018. Unprepared, not knowing to expect, Mike dressed in the wrong clothes that Danny corrected by bringing an extra pair of jeans for him to change into. They tried different offerings that MGP were offering their new company. They had never been to a tasting before and were surprised to be trying a proof down fully proof version of the whiskey's available. They won't even guide through it. They were given samples and time to taste. Then they realized where well, they could excel, especially being less experienced in the whiskey world. 80 proof beginner craft whiskey was an empty hole in the market that pretty much only Angel's Envy was in. They knew they needed a great price point and to have it readily available. Instead of going with more rare and expensive 11 year old whiskey, they started off with two different mash bills of two to three year old whiskey. They decided to blend the mash bills and Although it took some fine tuning, this is what they created. And since day one of Penelope, they were the only investors and worked incredibly close with MGP to create a great product. That was until May 8th, 2023, when MGP announced that they'd be acquiring the company for $105 million. Danny and Mike both planned to stay within the company and use MGP's resources to accelerate the growth of their products. They have created a unique brand, a niche, and a loyal fan base that keeps people buying more including this bottle, the original full grain bourbon. Now I kind of do, before we talk a little bit more about the whiskeys that they, that MGP makes, or at least contract distills, I do kind of want to talk about contract distilling versus sourcing whiskey. If we go through the MGP website, we can have a look at the 11 different mash bills. Uh, and you can contact them saying, hey, I want a sample of this, and I'm interested in buying some. And that would be what we call sourcing. And this is essentially what Danny and Mike did is they went to go source them. Now, that's not the only way to do it, is just going in and buying what they have available. 
There's also contract distilling, which is when you walk with the distillery to, whether that's to have a unique mash bill, or just to be with them from the beginning to the end of the creation. So this is something you see specifically, let's see, what, what whiskey do I have that's an example of this? For example, this is uh, from Pursuit Spirits, the people that have the Bullman Pursuit podcast, and they're very transparent about what they do. And so this one, despite being a single barrel, they contract distill with Bald Sound Bourbon Company and some other places. Well, from day one, they've been working with them to create something that this is five years of age. They've been with them for five years. If you want to create something from from scratch and a little bit more unique, contract distilling is the way to go. If you are just doing a one-off or don't really care what's going through or making specific batches, sourcing whiskey is kind of a more common way as well. Now, neither of these are going to be bad ways. They're both excellent ways to build spilt brand and can do a, you can do a lot to make it unique whether that's finishing or blending them or even just branding for example this is one of my favorite bottles this is the freeland bourbon this is, comes out of portland oregon although it is distilled in um, indiana and they say it's only aged three olds but then they finish it in pinot barrels in oregon pinot barrels oh it smells so good and then have some amazing branding behind this. Look at this bottle, you know? And the story behind it being like women run is an excellent way to do it. You can also look at something like Nulu, where they are very transparent on where they get it. Distilled by MGPI of Indiana. Supposedly Redwood Empire, like this one right here, is distilled, is contract distilled through MGP. But if you look all across the label, all it's gonna say is bottled by Redwood Empire, product of California. And there's other companies too that may be doing different things. So this is Fort Hamilton. This is the double barrel rye on the back. What you're gonna see is distilled in New York and Indiana, bottled by Alex Fault Spirits in Brooklyn, New York. So they could be sourcing from a few different places and blending it together. You see this with other brands too. Um, but for example, Penelope is kind of unique because they're only walking through one company versus doing a bunch of different ones. But let's try something that's not Penelope. Let's try some other MGP. And I think what better way is to go with one that is transparent about being MGP, and that's this guy. This is the New Nulu Double Toasted, and this is the West Coast Exclusive. And off the bat, you can tell it's toasted. You can really smell it. Really vanilla. Like, not just... Ah, oh, that reminds me of vanilla. This is like a vanilla bean. And then that flavors continues. You get what feels like toasted marshmallow off the bat. I'd love to hear what your guys' favorite products are from MGP or other places that contract is still also slow whiskey from MGP. Let me know below. And also, let me know what other distilleries we should be looking for to try and taste and to learn about. Cheers, you guys.